All right, if you would please turn in your Bibles to Esther chapter 6. Esther chapter 6, we're going to continue in our study of the book of Esther and God's deliverance of his people. So Esther chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 14. What are the odds? Have you ever found yourself asking that question yourself? And like, what are the odds that a certain something might happen? And on occasion, you can actually figure out what those happen to be. And so my, I'm, I'm kind of curious here. Like, has anyone ever been bitten by a venomous snake? I didn't think so, but I was curious. But in the United States, at least, that you, your odds of that happening are actually 1 in 37,500. So not, not nothing, but not great. You're much more likely never to do that. In fact, you're much better, you're much more likely to write a New York Times bestseller than to be bitten by a venomous snake. Anyone been bitten by a bear? You never know. Sometimes you learn a lot about people. But, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> well, the chances of that happening, the odds of that happening are 1 in 2.1 million. So uh, a, a very, you're much more likely to be bitten by a snake than a bear. How about this? How about a shark? Anybody bitten by a shark? Nobody? I, especially being where we are, I really didn't expect that. But 1 in 11.5 million. You're actually more likely to become president than bitten by a shark, just so you know. What are the odds of being, of being bitten by all three? Not at the same time, but I mean, like, in your lifetime. One in 893 quadrillion. You know how I know that? Because Dylan McWilliams was bitten by all three. Uh, in, in a span of about three years, he was bitten by all three. And so there was a time he was hiking out in Utah and, and uh, was bitten by a rattlesnake and didn't even go to the hospital. He knew, I don't know why you would trust this, but he knew that 60% uh, uh, of the time the snakes don't actually inject any venom. They just bite you and nothing happens. So he said, well, I'll take a chance. He got sick, but he never, like, nothing beyond that ever happened. He was actually uh, camping with some friends when a bear actually bit him by the head and pulled him out of his tent and uh, was able to kind of fend that bear off. And then his friends, you know, the noise and chaos that ensued after that scared the bear away. He got nine staples in his head as a result of that one. And then lastly, he got bitten by a shark while he was surfing, by a tiger shark, no less, and got a bunch of stitches for that one. And, and it, it makes you, you look at those things, like, what are the odds of all that happening? I think the only thing left for him is he gets hit by lightning. And he's got, his bases are covered, and he'll be good. He'll never have to worry about anything else the rest of his life, I suppose. But as you consider the providence of God in the book of Esther, when we get to chapter 6 here, you, you have to start asking yourself that very question. Like, what are the odds? And the reason I bring it that way, or present it that way, is because in life, we are very often tempted to, when something happens that we can't explain, and maybe it worked out well for us, maybe, maybe not so much, we're tempted to sometimes dismiss it. Well, it was just a happenstance, or a circumstance, or it was random, or something it would have happened anyway, or, you know, a, a stroke of luck, something along those lines. We're dismissive of these things. And it would be tempted, in, as we read the, the Esther chapter 6, in a book that never mentions the name of God, to say that is a circumstance, that is a happenstance. What, what are the odds that all these things are happening? But I think even the most secular of people will read Esther chapter 6 and at some point go, okay, the odds are too much. It's impossible for what unfolds in Esther chapter 6 to truly be by blind chance and simply random. It just doesn't work. Something is pushing this forward. Something's driving this forward. Some unseen hand is guiding and directing the events that are taking place in here. And in Esther chapter 6, the events here are it's something less than 24 hours. It's not a massive window, but it's a very small window. That all these events are happening, and they have a larger bearing on the outcome of the events in and of Esther as a whole than any individual or group human actors in the entire book. It changes everything. And what we find here is that God is working behind the scenes of Esther, the book of Esther, and, and makes it really absolutely impossible to deny that God's not here. And I have just two points that we're going to be looking at that are from uh, Ian Duguid's commentary on this subject. They're just too good not to use, and they fit really the flavor of the chapter as we go through this. 
But as we, we think through this, understand that God is always providentially working behind the scenes. And when it seems like he's not doing the least, he very well may be doing the most. So you can't always discount what's going on in reality based on what you see because you don't know what's unfolding behind the scenes. And what that does is then it invites us to trust God and invites us to lean into him and say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know if you're doing anything. But I'm going to trust you. And we're going to watch and wait to see this thing unfold. And so let's read verses 1 through 3 of Esther chapter 6. On that night, the king could not sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. And we'll stop there. Sleepless in Susa. That's what we find. Sleepless in Susa. Of all the things... Of all the things that could be a turning point in the book, it's this one, verse 1. The king can't sleep. I don't want to take anything away from Esther, because certainly she is brave. She's, she's fasting. We're going to imply by that that she's been praying. She's working. She, she's doing a lot of things. She's doing really everything that she should be doing. I don't want to take anything away from her. And yet all of her actions and all of her planning and all of her due diligence that she has done up to this point and even beyond that will pale in comparison to the fact that the king can't sleep and the effect that it has on the rest of the story. God uses insomnia. And this is actually one of the funniest chapters, not just in the book of Esther, but honestly in all of Scripture. If you give it some room to breathe, and hopefully that will come out a little bit as we go through this, but... The, the most amazing thing about this, this passage here, is, especially verse 1, is it's so much nothing. Like, it's so easy to read this verse and think, so what? But realize the impact of the fact that the king can't sleep has on the story. And we'll point some of those things out. But this is the major turning point. And it's, it's just, honestly, it's not exciting. I mean, it'll make you yawn. Right? It's not that exciting. <clears throat> But it is the turning point that God uses to start doing something. And it's not at all what we would expect him to do. See, what you might not realize, if the king sleeps, Mordecai dies. It really is that simple. If the king gets a good night's sleep, everything else changes. And I know you maybe probably do, but maybe not know the whole rest of the story. But Mordecai, or excuse me, Haman is on his way to see the king that's left over from verse chapter 5. He's there going to before the king to ask for the life of Mordecai. He wants to put him on the gallows. He's coming that next morning. And yet that night the king can't sleep. That changes everything. But this plan that Esther and Mordecai have been working on, if he dies, this plan, which is already not a sure thing, is in, is in jeopardy of falling apart right before their very eyes. Mordecai will not be there to encourage Esther. He will not be able to be there to guide her. If she finds out that he's dead, and, and especially in this terrible and tragic way, I, I mean, think about how slow and hesitant she's going to be to even have this feast or do anything else by that, because the person that's been there, this, this mentor, this, this basically this father figure, her cousin, is gone. The whole story changes. So verse 1 becomes this turning point of the, of the story. But what's amazing here is that nobody's got the wheel to turn it. No human figure. Esther in this passage is mentioned really basically in passing towards the end. Mordecai is just, ta he's, he's just talked about. It's just something that happens to him. But he himself virtually has no role to play. The main characters, the main people that you would expect to be putting their hands on the wheel and trying to turn this story and drive it one way or the other, they're not here. And when we actually look at this, this turning point, like there, there's nobody that's actually doing it. It just starts to churn, to change. How is it possible? It's what we've been calling providence. It's been a while since we've kind of defined, defined that. But it's this idea here that God will see to it, that God will see to it that something happens. It's God's purposeful action in the events in, of human history that he's, he's guiding and directing things for a reason and for a purpose. And we see that going on clearly here in this passage, that he will provide and sustain the world, and in this case, his people. 
He's going to make sure that the Jews are delivered from this most recent of threats. And what's amazing here is that God doesn't need a miracle to do it. Basically, every other book of the Bible, we see when something like this happens, some miracle, some vision, some dream, some uh, angel, some sign, something happens that's miraculous, that's unexplainable in and of itself that changes the story, that impacts the direction of everything that's going, and, it, it, and that's where the conclusion finally happens. We don't have that here. Our, our miracle is the king can't sleep. That's not a miracle. But it's what God is going to use to affect the greatest change in this entire story. And the fact that no one is actually tied to this event actually starts pointing away from all the human characters and brings everybody's attention up. That everybody that reads, especially this chapter, they have to look up and say, if God, doesn't, if God didn't do this, then nobody did. This is God, pure and simple. He's the one who will deliver his people. And so it's because the king can't sleep that he recognizes and sees this oversight. And that's what we've been looking at here in verses 2 and 3. And so this, this, this not being able to sleep starts this change, chain of events. And I don't think, and you've probably experienced this before in your life, like there's nothing worse than laying in bed at night and like you can't sleep and like your, your body, sometimes you're just tired, sometimes you just lay there and you're like, what did I do? Like, I didn't drink any coffee. I didn't, you know, like, I wasn't watching scary things like the news or movies. or like, like, And you're like, what in the world? And like, your body's like, just, nope, not tonight. You're just going to lay there. And you're like, oh, come on. And we try things, right? We try things. And, and sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. But you think about here, the king, he's got a lot of options. And, it, and it's truly amazing that he doesn't fall asleep here because he was, he's coming off a feast with Esther, and we know the king loves to drink, and he was drinking here towards the end. You know, he could have just been like, man, maybe I just need a nightcap, something else to kind of push me over the edge. He doesn't do that. He has an entire harem full of women at his disposal. He doesn't call one. He could have just gotten up and gone for a walk. He doesn't do that. I think, honestly, he just really wanted to sleep. He calls probably for the most boring thing he can find. He says, come read to me the history of my own kingdom, of my own reign, the Chronicles, the history book. That's what he, that's what he asks for. What are the odds? And lo and behold, these young men come in here, and they're going to start reading to him. And where do they turn? They turn to this story that we have recorded for us actually towards the end of Esther chapter 2 that just felt random and nothing ever comes of it, but it's included in here because it's this. But we realize that Mordecai thwarted an assassination attempt against the king. And that's what we're reading about here with Big Thana and, and Teresh, the king's eunuch, <clears throat> who guarded the threshold of the king, probably the king's bedroom. And, and he starts looking at this. And, and, he's, and he remembers this incident, but not the reward. He's like, I remember that. This is five years in the past. He says, I remember that happening. I remember that going on. And he can remember the story, but not the reward. He's like, wait, what did I do for him? And the reason that's important is because the, the Persian kings were actually notorious for actually going, like, really giving lavish rewards for those who did this kind of a service. And history actually records a few of those for us. There were a few sailors that were involved probably in his war against, the, uh, against Greece themselves that had done some valor, um, uh, heroic acts and things, and he actually awarded them land, like a lot. There's another one, uh, an individual had saved actually the brother of Xerxes, the, the brother of the king, and he had made him the governor of a city like, these are not small things. Xerxes should, Ahasuerus, he should be able to remember what it is that he did for him. And he's like, I, nothing's coming to mind. What happened? And then the people that are reading it says, well, you didn't do anything. And that should have been a life-altering moment for Mordecai. Life-changing position and title and money and prestige, all of those kinds of things. And honestly, for, for Ahasuerus here, Xerxes here, same guy, that, 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 and you want to make sure that people that are loyal to you, that help you in that way, you want to make sure for your own survival that they're well rewarded, they're willing to risk their lives to protect you. You want to make sure that they're rewarded. And he can't believe it. After five years, he never did anything 
for Mordecai. Now please tell me, what are the odds that on the eve of Haman coming in to ask for the life of Mordecai, to put him on a gallows and kill him, not only can the king not sleep, but he's reminded of his servant Mordecai who saved his life five years prior. He's reminded or better discovers that Mordecai was never rewarded for that work and effort that he had done here. I think it's more likely that you'd be bitten by a snake, a bear, and a shark, don't you? What's amazing here is that we're not done. The odds, they're too low. They're still too likely. As crazy as they all are, they're still too likely. We need to put more uh, contingencies into this to make and really increase the odds because they're too low, too possible. And we're going to do that. Let's read verses 4 through 11. And the king said, Who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak of the king uh, about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the, on the horse to the square of the city. Proclaim me before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. And so Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai. <clears throat> and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Haman's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. But it started out with a good morning. It was a good day for Haman. He had been encouraged. It had put a smile on his face the night before when his wife and his family had suggested, go ask the king to put Mordecai on the gallows and get rid of this thorn in your flesh. And he marched right down there early into the palace grounds and said, I want to see an audience with the king so I can take care of this. He's excited. He's happy to commit this murder. It just started out as a good day. And that's why he's there so early. And so when the king is looking for someone to advise him now at this point, like, what should I do to this person, Mordecai, that I want to award, he finds out that Haman's in the courtyard already. He says, perfect, bring him in. And that's what he does. And I can see Haman going in there before the king and just walking in right in and saying, sire, I have a, I have a, a request of you. And the king just kind of looking out the window, kind of lost in thought. Just, what should be done to the man whom the king wants to honor? Cuts him right off. And there in mid-sentence, Haman's kind of like, well, since you're asking, let me tell you. And Haman is so full of himself at this point in his life that it never even crosses his mind to ask, who might this person be that you want to honor? He just assumes it's him. Now think about this. It's an empire. There are millions of people in this empire. There's millions of people, and it never even crosses his mind that perhaps maybe the king might decide to honor somebody else at some point besides him. But he doesn't ask. He just assumes that it would be him. And again, what we find here is that Haman's idol of prestige and honor and power is coming out in full force, and it's going to destroy him. It's going to consume him. And he just tells the king what he would want. You know, had he only asked the question, who? He could have, but he didn't. I think had he known it was Mordecai, I'm sure he would have just said something very, very different. You know, perhaps maybe, you know, King, I don't know, maybe a, a, a thank you card and maybe one of those quick trip, you know, gift cards. I mean, he, Mordecai's at the gate all the time drinking coffee. I'm sure he would enjoy that. Something, you know, small, subtle, you know, a little something for his service. And instead... He says something very, very different. 
He says how he wants to be honored. And, and honestly, what's amazing here is that as the king is asking this question, how should he be honored, the king leaves out the very same information that Haman had left out earlier, the identity of the person or the people that he was referring to. See, what goes around comes around. What we find here ultimately is that Haman wants to be king. It's the only thing really that's left for him. His request may seem strange to you, but he literally wants to wear the robe that the king has worn. Not a robe that's been made by the king's tailor or the king's favorite brand, if you will. No, he actually literally wants to wear the king's clothing. He wants to ride on the king's horse. And that crown that you see, and there was probably a headdress on the horse, that would have been paraded around like this is actually his stuff. So that people see him, would almost mistake him for the king. That's exactly what he wants. It's really the only thing left. He has everything else. He has wealth and prestige and, and all this other stuff. The only thing left for him in all of the world to obtain to is to be king. This actually reminds me a lot of a scene from the movie Aladdin, honestly. Towards the end of that, there's, a, there's that scene where Jafar wants to be this powerful magician. He wants to be the king of Agrabah, and he's seeking out to do this. And, and he finally gets his hands on the genie and asks the genie to make him this powerful individual, give him all the things that he wants. And he's granted those things. And Aladdin challenges him and says, you know what, like you have all this, but no matter how much you have, the genie gave you all of that stuff. He can take it away. He's more powerful than you are. And the people that are around him, Jasmine and all the others, are looking at him like, are you crazy? Why are you encouraging this guy? He's already maniacal and crazy, and you're going to make him more powerful. We can't defeat him now, let alone that way. But see, Aladdin knew something. The way to defeat him was through his own greed and desire and self-interest. And so he goes, okay, genie, make me an all-powerful genie. And he feels even more powerful, more able to do certain things. But what he doesn't realize is now that he's enslaved to a lamp. See, his own ambition is his own undoing. And for Haman, this thing is, the same thing is true here. His own ambition is going to be his own undoing. And he never sees it coming. If you haven't thought of it already, you've, it's probably coming to you quickly, but Proverbs 16, 18, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And Haman's patient could be right next to that verse and says, yes, that's... That'll wake you up anyway. We still, I think we're good. Sorry about that. But, but this pride goes before a fall, and, and that's exactly what he's doing. His arrogance and his pride, he just wants more, and it's going to destroy him. And he never sees it coming. He's about to be humbled, though. Go do that to Mordecai. Every last bit of it. Like, don't skimp on anything. Can you imagine? I would love, you know, of all the, you know, you go to heaven, you're like, you know, go through the movie reels of the, you know, the books of the Bible and the scenes and stuff. Like, I want to see this. I want to see this. This is, this is on my, my list. Like, I want to see Haman's face when God's, uh, and when, when, uh, when Xerxes goes, go do that to Mordecai. You want to talk about jumping off a of cloud nine without a parachute? I mean, just boom, there he is. And, and like, what? I don't know how he holds it together. He goes in there to ask for the life of his enemy, and on the way out, he's actually going to make basically his enemy and give him the very thing that he wants more than anything else in the world to be king. He had to have been speechless. And yet, here he is going out to do to Mordecai what he wants more than anything else. And he does. He dresses him up like the king, and he leads him around the streets of Susa. And imagine the looks that they must have got. And I would imagine the, the vast majority of the empire has no idea of the inner workings of some of the things going on in Susa. But right here, the Jews are looking at this. They know that Haman hates them. They know who Mordecai is. And here's, here's Haman, the second most powerful person in the world, leading Mordecai, this lowly gatekeeper, through the streets. This is what's to be done to the man whom the king wants to honor. And like, wait, what? How does that work? Those guys hate each other. The confusion, the looks, the bewilderment of everything that's going on in here. And I do wonder also if the, if the robe that they had to 
take and go through the city square here didn't take him right past his own home. And with the commotion going on in the street, if his wife and his sons and his advisors and everything kind of came out and said, wait, what is Haman doing? He went to the king to ask for the life of Mordecai, and now he's leading Mordecai around on a horse wearing the king's garment and proclaiming and honoring him. This doesn't make any sense. What are the odds? Haman had other plans, but he's utterly powerless to destroy the one that God chooses to honor. As I thought about this, I also kind of wondered here that if, if as Mordecai is riding on this horse, that he wasn't a little bit curious about the things that were going on here. And perhaps also while walking past, riding past Haman's house, seeing the gallows in the backyard, and does he know that those were there for him? Is he wondering why those are there for him? And yet here he is dressed like a king, being led about by the man who wants to kill him. I can't help but think that Mordecai really is all of us who are in Christ. To be wearing the righteous robes of the king as if they were our own, and to look at an empty cross knowing that that was our future, that that was our destiny, until someone intervened and changed everything. And what's amazing here is that Mordecai didn't do it. What's amazing is Esther didn't do it. None of them had any part to do or to play here. Mordecai can't take credit for these reversals. Someone else did it. And we also give God all the glory for what he has done for us. If we are in Christ, we understand that God did this. Christ did this. He laid down his life that we might go free, that we place upon ourselves, or actually he places on us, his robes of righteousness, and we escape the cross, death. And yet at the same time, we realize the gallows are still there in our story. They're there for a reason. And they cannot remain empty for long. If Mordecai is truly to be delivered and free, someone must be on them. And we'll see later who that will be. But the gallows have no claim on Mordecai any longer. He has been saved. And for all of us who are in Christ, we understand that we also have been saved. Not through any works not through any effort that we have done, but what he has done. But now we also find that Mordecai is doomed. Let's read the, the end here, uh, 12 and 13, I suppose. <clears throat> it says this, Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning, and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. And then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. You know, when it's all said and done, Mordecai just goes back to the gate. He resumes his position where he had always been. Worldly honor like this, it never lasts long. We remember that this is Haman's idol, not Mordecai's. Haman, however, is so humiliated. He can't show his face anymore. He literally covers his face and runs home, humiliated by everything that's just gone on. And here's the best part. His family, they start talking with him a little bit, and, and they're just kind of like, you know what, it's game over, buddy. You're done. They, there's, where's the encouragement? Where's like, okay, you'll get him the next time? None of that. None of that. And they're like, oh, wait, he's Jewish? It's over. And Dan, Pastor Daniel and I, we always like to sit down and talk through these things a little bit, and we're like, Wait, what? He's Jewish. You're di like, did you not know he's Jew? I mean, this, this entire thing has gone on because Mordecai is a Jew, and he thinks that he can take out all the Jews because he's angry at Mordecai. Like, that's been the driving factor. And all of a sudden here, it's like, oh, we didn't realize that Mordecai was Jewish. Uh, what? There is a commentator that believes that that's actually true. It's hard to reconcile that with chapter 5. It talks about Mordecai being a Jew as he's talking to his family. I don't know. But it is a possibility. However, I think perhaps that she's being a little prophetic and historic at the same time. She understands that <clears throat> Haman, being a descendant of Agag, remember he's an Agagite, 
that king that Saul was supposed to kill many, many years prior to that, the Amalekites, the king of the Amalekites. But here he is, a descendant of Agag, falling before Mordecai, a descendant of Kish, or a descendant of King Saul, just like what had happened before. And now that Mordecai has started to gain the upper hand, it will be like it once was. You will lose just like your ancestors did. And notice, as you look at that, how sure they are. There's not really a question. Uh, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome, but will surely fall before him. They're certain of this. There's no vote of confidence of his success here at this moment in time at all. And they're not wrong. And now let's read verse 14 quick. It says this, uh, While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. And that's really the way that the scene ends. But I just like the way the verse 14 kind of breaks in there. Just, it's real abrupt. And it's almost like, I know these are eunuchs that are bringing him to Esther's banquet, but it's almost like you have guards coming to take a, a man who's on death row to his last meal before his execution. Because, of course, well, they are. Just nobody knows it yet. But this is the way this whole thing unfolds, and it's happening fast. But this is Esther chapter 6. And then you get through the chapter, and you keep having to ask yourself, what are the odds? What are the odds that all of these things happen in just this way? You can't dismiss it as random. You can't dismiss it as chance. It's the providence of God working behind the scenes, even when it felt like he was doing nothing. He was doing everything. Just some closing thoughts that I think might be some good uh, discussion for you, maybe over lunch. I wasn't exactly sure where to put them otherwise, but one of the interesting things here to me is that Haman has to ask permission to, to, have, to take the life of Mordecai. Again, remember who he is. He's the second most powerful person in the kingdom. Certainly he can take out some lesser official without issue, without a need to go to the king. And yet he can't. He has to go to the king to ask permission. Just like Satan goes to God before he touches Job. I think we're meant to see that. That no one can touch us without God's permission. Even Satan, with all of his power, with all his ability, with all his hatred and everything else like that, yet he can do nothing without God's permission. The other thing that's related but different is this idea of providence. Must providence be for our good? If God is going to see to it, must that seeing to it always be for our good? You think about this story. Nothing bad ultimately happens to the main characters here. I mean, for Esther, you can maybe argue for an exception here because of how she winds up be becoming the king's uh, queen. We don't know exactly all the ins and outs and details of that, but there's some, some suspicious things going on there. But, but ultimately, she becomes the queen. Mordecai never actually suffers harm. The Jews never actually suffer harm. Now, there's some dark days in there, and there's some fear that's going on in there that lasts more than just a day or two. I'm not going to take that away from them, but ultimately nothing bad actually happens to anybody, and eventually they're given a great victory over their enemies. But we all know people who experience much more than a close call in life. I think of those Afghan believers again as the latest case. They're following after Christ. And Beth was sharing with me just before Sunday school, really, about some of the, the issues that are going on in there and, and the destruction and really murder of those Christians and, and, and the church that is over there. And just how, being on the phone with somebody, I think you said, and just there were screams, shouts, and, and then just dead silence. They've been attacked. And they were gone. And that's not a close call. Where was God in this? They're following after Christ. And there are probably still many more believers that are over there that are risking everything. They cannot get out. And they're looking for that turning point, And nobody seems to be grabbing the wheel. And unfortunately, history is full of people who don't, do not escape or they suffer for the sins of others. Where's providence? I know this feels like it's turning into a bit of a more of a theodicy than anything else, but it's a legitimate concern. We wondered, Lord, what, what are you doing? 
I think we find a little bit of help from a couple commentators here. One is Barkusian. He says, God does not abandon his people, and he ultimately reigns over all of history. But this does not mean that wicked people won't perpetrate evil that will deeply affect our lives. Likewise, it doesn't mean that God's people will be spared from catastrophe. But the symptoms of our broken world do not indicate that God is powerless to act. God can use even those seemingly little things in life to affect a turnaround of fortunes. In the Esther story, the sleeplessness of the king is God's doing, an essential part of his plan to save his people. Karen Jones would add this. He said the, she says, The path to joy that God promises may wind through the swamps of suffering and despair. I think we need both of those cautions. That we can't ever judge the moment that we are in as the whole thing. We have to see and wait for what it is that God is doing. And know, though, that at the end, no matter what happens on this earth, those who are in Christ are assured of an eternity in glory with their loving Heavenly Father. Right? We know that those Afghan believers that were killed, if they were in Christ, they are in glory right now, and they are celebrating their Savior, and they are not bitter. They might be crying with the saints in, in Revelation, how long, O Lord, will you allow this to continue? But they are not pointing an accusing finger at God and saying, how dare you allow this to happen like this? They're not. And history is full of individuals who have gone through terrible and hard places and hard things, and they're not pointing their finger at God. They're throwing crowns at his feet and saying, glory, glory. And so must we. So must we. So as we think through God's providence, and we see what it is that God is doing we do have to stop and ask ourselves, what are the odds of this? And Esther 6 will not allow you to just say, that's random circumstance, that's serendipitous, that's just lucky. No such thing. God's hand was very much behind the scenes and doing what no human being could ever dream of doing. And when you're in the midst of suffering, look for the hand of God and see what it is that he is doing. Develop an eye for Jesus. And see, like, even as hard and as difficult as things might be, and say, yet, God is doing something. I see this glimmer of hope. I see an effect, a change, a light at the end of the tunnel. He's doing something. Because those little things add up to big things very quickly. God is working. It might be behind the scenes. And that's why Esther is such a, a source of hope for the Jews for millennia. They turn to the book of Esther, and they find hope here, and they see that God is working, and he's doing things. They don't always understand in the moment, and it should be a source of hope for us, too. So we trust him as he continues to work in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this morning and this moment as we consider Esther chapter 6, an amazing story. And Lord, all the twists and the turns that take place in this chapter. And Lord, we're challenged and reminded that as often as we want to be dismissive, sometimes of the little things, it's like, well, that was a nice fortuitous accident. And to not give you the glory that is due. In a book like Esther, with all those kinds of things, we realize, okay, that's impossible. Obviously you did that. And yet, Lord, in our lives... If we look, we'll see the same kinds of things that are taking place in our lives. And we should not be dismissive of it. Lord, you're working all over the place. Lord, help us to develop that eye, that look for you and the process in which you're, you're involved. And to trust you as we continue our way through. Thank you for your faithfulness to Esther and the Jews. Thank you to your faithfulness here to Missionary Baptist Church. Thank you to your faithfulness to the Afghan believers suffering as their country falls. Lord, thank you for your grace that sustains us in all of the storms of life. In Christ's name, amen.